Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Did you ever have one of those storybooks that had more than one story in it? You know, one of those ones that you'd bug your parents, hey, just one more story, one more story, and they would just roll their eyes? <laughs> well, we're looking at my bedtime book of two minute stories, which is supposed to be the answer to tell me a story. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not quite sure how I'm going to comment on the art because she wants to try something. I was thinking maybe we'd see how many of these I could get through in 10 minutes. But I was thinking we could still allow Lux commentary. You know, fair use and all. I can always hit pause on the timer. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to start the timer until I get through the introduction. We need to start it at the first story. Yep. So, this is my bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. And... Copyright 1969, Hero Book Limited. And we'll get through the introduction first. Introduction. Tell me a bedtime story is a cry that can bring dismay to even the most well-meaning mother, especially as it always seems to come when patience is at an end and minutes seem like hours. My bedtime book of two-minute stories is designed to fill the needs of the child at such a moment without stretching the adult's good humor to its limits. Here are 58 stories, each of which will take but two minutes to read. The stories are new, appealing, and instructive in a subtle and entertaining way. The pictures are a delight to the eye and a stimulus to the imagination. With my bedtime book of two-minute stories in hand, you can afford to spoil your children. Don't just read them one story. Read them two. <laughs> Cute. Mm -hmm. Also, there's some very cute art on the first page here, though two of the boys' faces look kind of copy and paste, though I don't think they had that when this was made, unless they actually physically copied and pasted them, which is possible. But it's very nice, very simplistic art. One color, unless you count gray as a color, then they have multiple shades of gray. Yeah, well, these are all pulled from different stories within the book, as is the front cover, as these go with various stories of the 58 that are in here. All right, time to start the timer. And now. The story of Jeremy and Lollipop Brown. Jeremy woke up one morning and heard a very funny noise. It sounded like somebody blowing his nose, but what a big blow it was. Jeremy hopped out of bed and looked out of the window to the park in front of his house. What do you think was there? A great big gray elephant with his trunk up in the air. It was the elephant making the big noise. Well, what would you have done? Jeremy was so excited he shouted for his mother and daddy to come and see. They watched the elephant while his daddy told Jeremy all about the big circus that was coming to the park that day. It was lovely for Jeremy. All day he watched the caravans come and the cages with the lions and tigers and all the lovely horses and lots and lots of people. The next day, Mother took him to see the circus. Inside the enormous tent were big, bright lights, although the sun shone outside. First, the band played very loud, and in came the ringmaster, a very important man in a red coat and a black top hat. Then came the clowns, and Jeremy loved them all. The tall, thin one with great big feet, the little tiny one with bright orange hair, and most of all, he loved Mr. Brown the one in the baggy check pants. He was the funniest of them all in his special automobile that kept falling to bits, and when it did, Mr. Brown laughed and laughed. Jeremy liked the seals who played the trumpet, the prancing horse with pretty ladies riding, the lions and tigers, and the man on the high wire. The elephants danced, and the Shetland ponies did tricks, and everybody had a wonderful time. Then it was time to go home. Before he went to bed, Jeremy told his daddy all about the circus and said thank you very much to his mother for taking him. In the morning, the circus was still there, so after breakfast, Jeremy sat by his bedroom window and had a lovely view of all the circus people doing their work. They swept out the caravans, hung up the washing, and carried buckets of water, and everybody was very busy. Soon Jeremy saw Mr. Brown come out of his caravan sit on the steps, and start to eat his breakfast. He didn't look quite the same without his funny painted face, but Jeremy knew him by his baggy check pants. He was excited, and he called out, Hello, Mr. Brown, and waved. And Mr. Brown waved back and said, 
Come and sit on my steps if you like, but watch how you cross the road. So down the stairs Jeremy went, and Mother took him over the road and said, Good morning, to Mr. Brown, and said they had seen him the day before. Mr. Brown smiled and said he would take Jeremy back at lunchtime. So after he had finished his breakfast, Mr. Brown took Jeremy by the hand and they went to see the animals. It was fun. Mr. Brown knew them all. Raja and Leo the lions, Tessa and Tonto the tigers, and Rosie and Daisy the elephants. And all the animals knew Mr. Brown. There were circus children too, and they came running to Mr. Brown shouting, Hello, Lollipop Brown! How are you today? That's funny, thought Jeremy, and he was just going to ask why when Mr. Brown reached into the big pocket of the baggy check pants and brought out a handful of lollipops and gave one each to all the children. Jeremy got a yellow one. Wasn't that a lovely surprise? Soon Mr. Brown took Jeremy home because it was time for Mr. Brown to go and paint his funny face on before the circus started again. Off he went with a laugh and a wave across to his caravan. Next day, all the caravans had gone when Jeremy woke up, but he will never forget his friend, Mr. Lollipop Brown. Time check. We have five minutes and 51 seconds left. <laughs> okay, apparently these are not two-minute stories when they're read the way I read them. <laughs> that was a very nice story, though because of probably having to keep within that two-minute mark, there's a lot of shortcuts like, Jeremy did this, and Jeremy did that, instead of figuring out way, some ways to describe that without saying, Jeremy did this. Also, you can see almost everything that was described. I think you actually can see everything that was described, because I didn't notice the woman over here on the horse. I only noticed this prancing horse. Yeah, so you see the marching band, and you see the lion, and the ringmaster, and the seal playing the trumpet, and you see the car of Mr. Brown as it's falling apart with him in it and you see two other clowns off to the side. The tiger's in a cage in the back. Elephant is up on a podium up on its hind legs. We see the high wires and there right in the crease between the two pages is the man on the high wire. Then we have a man on a unicycle. Riding around the barrier between the public and the ring. Which is interesting that the uh, lion and tiger cages are on the outside of that barrier. Yeah, especially with the illustration of the crowd being behind the tiger cage. Mm -hmm. I was originally looking at this and thinking that the crowd was only on one side, but then I noticed the pattern that they used to represent the crowd goes behind the tiger cage. I'm like, hey. Mm -hmm. So shall we move on to the next story? <laughs> or shall we do a quick summary of what you thought about this story and then move on to the next one? Well, I'm, I remember this book very well, and I had certain stories that were favorite than others. So unlike most things where I would actually read from beginning to end, I would thumb through and pay more attention to my favorites. Ah. And this is very nice, but it's also very dated because no one would walk their young son across the street to the circus and leave them alone with a man that they've never met. Yeah. But they do manage to fit some other lessons in here, like watch how you cross the road, and Jeremy doesn't go over by himself. His mother takes him over, and Mr. Brown brings him back. Also, description of all the work that the people at the circus have to do, so showing that it is a job, not just all fun and games. Okay. All right, starting the timer again. No. Mr. Mortimer and his secret. All the children in the park know Mr. Mortimer, the old tortoise with the black top hat. Every day in the summer, you can see them talking to him. Mr. Mortimer is quite old, of course. His little head and neck are all wrinkly, but his black eyes are shiny bright and twinkling. He loves the children, and they are very kind to him. Every day, they bring him carrots, bits of sweet apple, and fresh green lettuce leaves, which he likes very much. Like all tortoises, Mr. Mortimer goes for a long sleep in the winter, so you can never see him then. But as soon as the warm days come and the sun comes out, back comes Mr. Mortimer, just the same as ever. One hot Thursday, Ben, the man who looks after the park, decided to take some sandwiches for lunch and have a picnic instead of pedaling home on his bicycle at lunchtime. Mrs. Ben gave him lovely sandwiches, 
some with banana and honey, and some with egg. There were far too many for Ben to eat all by himself, and he thought he would give some to the tortoise. But Mr. Mortimer wasn't there. Ben looked everywhere, in the flower beds, by the swings, in the sand pit, and all round the paddling pool. But there was no sign of Mr. Mortimer. Well, that's a puzzle, said Ben to himself. I wonder where he is. Ben had to get on with his work after lunch, of course, but all afternoon he kept looking, and even when it was time for him to go home, he had still not found Mr. Mortimer. But next morning, when Ben got to work, there was the tortoise waiting for him, just as before. The next Thursday, Mr. Mortimer disappeared again, and the next week, and the next. Ben wondered where he went, but it didn't really matter. The park is big, and Mr. Mortimer is quite safe inside. Perhaps Ben would never have found out if it had not been for the twins. Nearly every day they come to the park with their mother and she sits and knits while they play in the sand pit or on the swings. If it is warm enough, they sail boats on the paddling pool. One day the twins had a birthday and one of the birthday presents was a yellow kite with lots of colored ribbons on it. Ben got it up in the wind, and then the twins held the string while the kite danced and sailed up in the sky. Then came a big gust of wind, and what do you think happened? The twins let go of the string, and the kite sailed away, off in the wind all alone, off over the park, high in the sky. Well, the twins were miserable because nobody knew how to catch the kite. But along came Ben, and he said, Cheer up, twins. I'll pop across the park on my bicycle, and if I'm quick, I might catch the kite. And off he went, pedaling away very fast. He went past the swings, past the sand pit, and past the paddling pool, right over to the gardens where the big bird cages are. It is quite a long way, over on the other side of the park. And that's where he saw the kite, still flying, but caught by the string on the little tree by the big parrot's cage. Very carefully, Ben unwound the string and was just getting ready to pedal back to the twins when he saw Mr. Mortimer. There he was inside the cage with the parrot. The big old parrot was sitting on his perch, talking and chuckling away to Mr. Mortimer, and Mr. Mortimer was on the floor of the cage with his black top hat upside down beside him. The top hat was upside down because it was full of carrots, bits of sweet apple, and fresh garden lettuce leaves. Mr. Mortimer and his friend the parrot were having a picnic. What do you think of that? Ben smiled and said, Fancy that. But he kept very quiet, so they didn't know he was there. Of course, Ben has never told anybody about the secret of Mr. Mortimer, who is always missing from the park on Thursdays after lunch. And then there's a little poem here as well. Once a pretty snowflake fell on our window pane, but when I tried to catch it, it flew away again. Today the sky was cloudy, and down the snowflake came. This time I didn't touch it, but it vanished just the same. False advertising, these are not two-minute stories. I could probably read this quietly to myself in two minutes, as in not speaking aloud. But how does anybody read this aloud in two minutes and give it any justice? Yeah, because time check, she's down to a minute 13 left on the timer. And we've gone through two stories that are only supposed to take two minutes each to read out loud. And she's really booking it. Yeah, I'm really not pausing at all. Lux isn't even trying to jump in with commentary. And just to let you know, I'm barely editing any of these. She's only made two mistakes. Very mild. And you won't even notice them because I'll edit them out, but I'm going to leave this in. <laughs> so, yeah. The art is very nice. It's very simplistic, but also very detailed at the same time. Most of the detail comes from the line work. The coloring just gives a nice hint of shading. The kids are very nicely done. Though the boy's pose is a little bit awkward. And you can see, uh, what was the tortoise's name? Mr. Mortimer. Mr. Mortimer, right in the corner there. Which is interesting, because he shouldn't be there while they're flying the kite, because Mr. Mortimer according to the story, is already down at the parrot cages. How did Mr. Mortimer make it from right next to the children all the way to the parrot cage, which is clear on the other side of the park? Maybe this illustrates a different day where they were flying a kite. But they got the kite for their birthday. Oh. Maybe this is a future. Well, 
It was a very nice story. I liked it. What were your thoughts on it? Very cute. It's still not one of the ones that I went to and read all the time. And I did kind of forget that they intersperse poems in here. I was like trying to figure out where to read it because it's actually at the top of the second page. So it would have interrupted the line, but the next morning when Ben, and that's the end of the first page, and the start of the second page is the poem, which would have been really awkward to go, when Ben wants a pretty snowflake, that's an awkward sentence. But they do have them differentiated. This particular poem is actually edged at top and bottom with a row of snowflakes. Ah, golden snowflakes. Yes, most of the coloring on this page is golden, gray, and black. Kind of like Never Ask for a Gucci Bird. So we're definitely not going to make it through five of these in ten minutes. We're not even going to make it through three because they're two-minute stories. I have a minute thirteen left. So what I was thinking is... So you're going to hit the timer go off probably right in the middle of her saying something. So we're going to stop there. You know, we're going to read the line again and go from there after discussing what we've read so far. Yes, because it seems interesting. You know, since they claim they were two-minute stories, felt like we should put it to the test. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. And starting now. The Rosebud Teapot. Once upon a time, there was a little teapot, and she had rosebuds dotted about all over her. She was very pretty, and she was a real china teapot. Do you know how she knew she was made of real china? If you held her up to the light, you could see the light shining through. And you can't do that with a teapot which is not made of real china. Rosebud knew she was something special, because she was always kept in the best china cupboard, and she was only brought out on Sundays and on very special occasions. But one day, someone was very careless and knocked her spout on the kitchen tap and chipped it. Poor Rosebud. It hurt quite a bit, and after that she cried every time she tried to pour out the tea. We can't use this teapot for best anymore, they said, because the spout is chipped and dribbles on the table. Rosebud didn't mind because now she was used every day, and she loved being kept busy. They put a sort of sponge collar round her neck to catch her tears and to stop the tea dripping on the tablecloth. But another sad thing happened. We ran out of ten minutes. <laughs> that was perfect timing. And another sad thing happened. We ran out of time. Uh, so, yeah, these definitely aren't two-minute stories, but I think they say that to keep it short, to say that these are short stories, you can read a bunch of them to your kid, and it shouldn't take long to read another one. So... Let's continue with the story, and then we'll share our thoughts on the story. But another sad thing happened. This time someone dropped her little rosebud hat and broke it. Poor Rosebud watched them throw her lid into the trash can. Now she felt very shabby because she never went out without a hat in the old days. Now we really can't use her anymore, they said, and she was pushed into the back of a dark cupboard. Poor Rosebud was soon covered with dust, and no one ever washed her pretty dress anymore. One day, after a long time without seeing anyone at all, someone took her out of the cupboard and said, You can have this for your jumble sale. It's no good to us anymore. They bundled Rosebud into a box with a lot of other old things, and away she went. She didn't know where. She landed up on a stand in the town hall jumble sale. She sat sadly surrounded by a lot of other sad things, worn out old things which someone had once loved but didn't love anymore. Lots of hands moved all over the stall, picking things up and putting them down again. No one bothered about Rosebud until almost the end of the day. A little girl picked her up and said, It is sweet, isn't it? Her mother said, Yes, dear, but its spout is chipped and it has no lid, but it's real china, you know. How do you know? asked the little girl. Hold it up to the light, said her mother. The little girl held it up to the light and saw the light shining through. It's only 25 cents, said the lady at the stand. I'll take it, said the little girl. Whatever do you want it for? asked her mother. I'll show you when I get home, said the little girl. And she took little Rosebud home very carefully. She loved little Rosebud and little Rosebud was so glad to be wanted again. I've never had anything made of real china before, said the little girl. The little girl went out into the woods, and when she came back, 
she filled little Rosebud with primroses. Don't they look lovely, said her mother. That was a good little flower vase you bought at the jumble sale. The primroses smelt so sweet and Rosebud felt so clean and she lived on the little girl's bedside table for always. And another poem, The Seasons. Spring comes when winter goes, hello flowers, goodbye snows. Summer's warm, the grass is cool, the frog goes plop into a pool. Buzzing bees and autumn trees, here comes winter, now we freeze. That was a cute little poem, and it's got some cute images representing the seasons right next to it. Also, it's a wonderful illustration of the little girl. Yes, very nice of her carrying rosebud full of primroses to her bedside table. And the illustrations on this particular page are mostly done without any kind of outline. And any, any outline they actually have are light lines representing, light lines in color, I should say, representing the arms and stuff like that, since her shirt is the same color throughout. It would be kind of hard to see the arms. So it's actually just a slightly darker shade of the same color to illustrate the differentiation of the girl's arm of all along her orange sweater. Wow, that's a very nice little story. Very cute. And it kind of reminded me of the Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> I could see that. It reminded me a little bit of a story that is in a different book of short stories. One that's a little darker that follows an article of clothing through its different lifespan. And I seem to remember another one like that about a bottle. I vaguely remember the one about the bottle too. So we've done three. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll pass the 10 minute mark and depending on how this edits down, we're currently at 25 minutes in the recording. Yes, for three short stories. I was originally thinking we'd try to do four, but I'm thinking maybe we should stop at three because this one also included the introduction from the book, which I won't read every time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think three will be good. It may vary depending on recording, but I think today three is good. Mm -hmm. So these are very fun. They're short and quick, engaging enough to keep your attention, but not so, oh my god, I need to think about this, that it's really going to keep you up after your parent reads them to you. Because the plots are so short, we don't really have much to analyze. They're very nice. They're very well done. There's not enough real room for any kind of plot holes, per se, or any real questions about why. Not really, though it is hard to do proper credit because the author credits are actually in the back. It says there are four authors for the book and on the back page it lists the four authors and what pages their stories are on. Hmm. So for the first story, the story of Jeremy and Lollipop Brown, that was written by Anna Webb. Mr. Mortimer and His Secret, also written by Anna Webb. The Rosebud Teapot was written by Rosemary Garland. So this has been three stories from my bedtime book of two-minute stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories were written by Anna Webb and Rosemary Garland. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, Please check out other entries in the Ember's Reading Room series. We have several different playlists and quite a few stories overall. And this looks like it will be a continuing saga. We're barely into it. Would you like to try and find a copy of this book? We'll try to post an Amazon link if we can find it for sale. I'm not sure if this would still be in print or not. I think it was old even when I got it. So I think we got it at a yard sale or a library book sale. Probably a yard sale. It doesn't have the stamping that my used library books had on them. Especially back then when they actually just stamped the books physically. Just feel like shopping? We probably have a plain regular Amazon link as well, along with the Ebates link to get cash back on purchases at stores you probably already shop at. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any contents of the Lux Analysis channel. Thank you.